Praise God. Praise God for these Christmas carols. Grab a seat. Welcome, Phil, Natalie, Alexander. Welcome. Lovely Christmas dress. Fantastic. It's good to come together Christmas Eve. Uh, tomorrow we have our Christmas Day service at 9am, so come along early, come along early live streamers, um, and then head off to enjoy the day with your family and friends. Um, but, but today is a time where, you know, Christmas Eve, sort of the eve, the, the night Christ was born in the manger, it's this special time of the year, almost, you would say magical, except, um, you know, magical has been abducted by the world. It's like magic means Harry Potter, but magical in a sense that something special is happening. Something special has happened. Christ the Lord has come into the world. And so just a couple of, uh, we're going to ha have a moment of, of prayer. So let me just invite us into a time of quiet reflection, a time of worship, and just quiet and stillness before God. Father God, we, we come before you in stillness. It's in your presence, in awe of who you are, the creator of all the universe, the alpha and the omega, God eternal. We come before you and we just want to sit at your feet. Father, we, we worship you, a holy God, where your ways are far above our ways where you have orchestrated history all for your glory. And we praise you that within that story, you have included us. That in that story, you have called us to yourself. That in that story, you sent your only son, Jesus, to come into the world, born as a baby. To grow up and to die on a cross for our sins and to be raised again on the third day. We thank you that part of that story means salvation for all. All who trust in the name of Jesus will be saved. And Father, this Christmas we are mindful of the things that we have and we're mindful of the things in the world. We're mindful of the, the war and the famines and the poverty and the injustices. Father, we pray for your kingdom come. We pray for peace over the nations. Lord, we pray over the wars in the overseas, the wars happening in Ukraine, the wars happening in Gaza, the wars happening in Africa and across the Middle East. And we ask that you would have compassion, that your compassion will be so clear upon the poor and oppressed. Pray that medical supplies will, will be able to reach them. Food and water will be able to reach those in need. We pray for those who take up arms, we pray that they would be able to go home safely, that war would end. We pray for those who are in power, those leaders making these decisions, that you would give them wisdom on how to just say no to war. Fill them with mercy and compassion. And Father, we pray too for all those who are, who are homeless and poor this Christmas. Lord, we pray for provision over them. We pray that they would have food to eat and a place to sleep, a place to be safe. We pray that you would help us to be your people in this situation, to be your hands and feet, to feed the poor, to care for the hungry. And Father, we pray for those who are experiencing loneliness and isolation, who are mourning the deaths of loved ones. Father, we pray that you'll your peace would be so clear with them. We pray that your, your comfort would be with them. 
We pray that they would be surrounded by the love of your people. Help us to open our eyes to those who are, who are, who are mourning around us, those who, who have a smile on the outside but inside are, are hiding a pain. Lord, help us to be compassionate and merciful, to be loving and kind. And Lord, we, we pray that your name be glorified in all that we do every day of the year. Help us to live fully surrendered lives to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, I'd like to give us a moment to, to say hi to one another. You know, let's welcome one another in the name of Jesus. All right, well, we're going to continue with our service. Uh, welcome, Lisbeth. Welcome. Grab a seat in the middle here, or wherever. That's all right, wherever you want. Um, so we have uh, just tomorrow's service, 9 a.m., so, you know, er, nice and early. Um, and there's a craft at the back for any, well, for Jacob and Bridie. You know, they'll be doing the little angel craft and uh, any, um, but... 
Uh, there's our off-street details online and cash in the box back there um, just to keep continuing to be generous towards God as a joyful, joyful giver. Um, but we, we have uh, a Bible reading just for a next little, little bit. Uh, I'll ask Elizabeth to read one verse um, and then uh, Phil's going to read our second passage for today. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, our reading uh, there is Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And you also have sermon notes on your on your bulletin there. Yes. Okay. Yeah. There okay. Oh, okay. Um, Isaiah seven fourteen. Okay. Uh, therefore, the Lord Himself will give you a son. The virgin will conceive and give uh, birth to a son. And we'll call him Emmanuel. We belong to God's bigger story and we don't need to be afraid. Okay, and I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Now this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her fiancé, being a just man, decided to break the engagement quietly so as not to disgrace her publicly. As he considered this, he fell asleep and an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to go ahead with your marriage to Mary, for the child within her has been conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this happened to fulfill the Lord's message through, the prof through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and he will be called Emmanuel meaning God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded. He brought Mary home to his wife, but she remained a virgin until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. Thanks, Phil. All right. Can you imagine the Christmas story? We have Joseph... And Mary. Um, Joseph, who's, who's heard this news that Mary's pregnant, it's like, can you imagine the surprise? But then also a sense of fear and then maybe betrayal. But not only his surprise, imagine Mary. Imagine her response when she sees, sharing this news with, with Joseph, an angel told me. But instead of a sigh of relief, we have Joseph having a a response of not sure what to do. Imagine the sense of betrayal that Mary feels there. And so Joseph is stuck in this dilemma. What do I do? You know, if, if we continue with this marriage, and, and a betrothal and engagement then was as good as being married in those times. If we continue, Mary is going to have a name dragged through the mud as someone who, who got pregnant while she was in, engaged to, to be married. And so he's in this dilemma. That, that's terrible. Maybe, but if I divorce her, that, there's public shame there. What's, what's he to do? And so he, he decides in his heart, you know what? I'm, gonna, I'm going to quietly divorce her. Maybe, maybe this will go away. And maybe after things have passed over, I'm just, I'm just guessing here, maybe he's going to reach out to Mary again. But there's no good option for, for Joseph at this point until he receives the dream. He gets that dream in the middle of the night, that visit from the angel, and it's like, the angel's like, don't worry, Joseph, this, this is from God. Take Mary home, marry her. What a sense of relief. Joseph is like, hallelujah, yes, <laughs> praise God. This, is, this that just, just confirms what Mary has already told me. Angel says, do not be afraid. And Joseph's like, yes, this is, this is good news. I am not afraid. This is better than what I imagined. God's biggest story is at work here. 
you know, this Christmas story, it's become so loaded with meaning. Even trying to decorate the yard, um, all you see online are candy canes and Santa Clauses and reindeers, all North Pole stuff. And you go through the shops, you see the Christmas trees, the presents, the stars, the fairy lights. It's awesome. It's it's wonderful season of the year. And the snow, even though we're in Australia, but, you know, it's Christmas. <laughs> oh, Christmas is so loaded with all this meaning in the shops. It's like the best marketing tool, honestly. It's one time of the year, everyone buys gifts for one another. And you're like racking your brain, what do I buy for them? It's like, uh, I'll just buy something they don't need. Here, movie tickets. Sorry for anyone who has bought movie. I've done it. I've done it. I've done, I've left the movie tickets over and over. But maybe for, for others, it's this sort of religious exercise. It's part of our religious identity. Christmas is here. All right, I get to go to church, Christmas and Easter. Those two events, you know, that, that identifies me as a, as a Christian. Or maybe uh, Christmas is for us a time of, you know, we're going to pause from work. And we're just going to spend that with family and friends. This is a time of reflection of all that's happened through the year. And for others, it is a, it is a terrible season. Honestly, for us, Christmas is a reminder of those who are not with us anymore. A reminder of those relationships that have been broken. Christmas can mean so many things. And for those who are not religious, Christmas is a time where we just, we're just happy. It's a time of just being happy. You know, you say Merry Christmas... We're the same way that you would say cheers. It's a time of happiness. All of these meanings over Christmas, it's become so convoluted. Like, which one is it? Is it Santa? But for us as followers of Jesus, we see that the Christmas story is right here. The Christmas meaning is what Elizabeth read out. Emmanuel, God is with us. So we hear the Christmas story of Christ the Son being born into the world. This is the original and most meaningful meaning of Christmas. When we come back to this, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. They will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's what we'll be talking about, reflecting on this Christmas season. What does it mean when God is with us? Not God is distant and far away. Not God is with us once or twice a year. Or not God is with us only when we obey Him. Not God is with us only when we go to church. But what does it mean that Jesus, the Son of God, came to be with us? What does it mean as followers of Christ to say, wherever I go, God is with me? I have a God who wants to be with me. Because Christmas is the event where I would say heaven and earth collide. We have this moment where God of eternity, God of all the planets and stars, solar systems, God who spoke a word and creation came into being. God who speaks a word and the storms are calmed. God who speaks a word and the demons flee. The God of all power, of all knowledge, the Alpha and Omega... God over time and space, where one day is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day, that God, he has come into this world. He has restricted himself to this time in history to say, the Son of God is going to be born as a fragile young baby, newborn baby. Can you imagine? How does all of that come as a child, as a baby, as a fetus. God of the universe enters into our world, breaks in to the present. What this means is that God's plans are being revealed. God's eternal plans from beginning to the end of time, all of that is being revealed, is happening in our time. All of that has broken in to the world in a really tangible way. God doesn't say, I will just give you these ideas to follow. I'll just give these ideas for you to live by. No, God himself comes into the world in the flesh 
and changes everything. And this means for us, where we think about our lives, it means that our existence isn't just an isolated event. It's not these 70, 100 years where we're born and then we die. That, that's our story. But it means that our story, these 100 years or whatever, exist within a bigger story of God's. It means that our lives do not just end when we die. And our lives did not begin just when we were born. But there is a bigger story being written well before we were born and a story that continues well after we die. And in Christ, our story joins with his. Because when we understand that we are part of God's bigger story, even when Joseph understood that, hey, this, this birth is actually part of God's bigger plan and the angel says, do not be afraid, we too can say, Understand, do not be afraid, because our story here is part of God's biggest story, and we know the ending there. We know that God's kingdom reigns. We know that his perfect kingdom will come. We know that all found in Christ will live forever, will be with God. And so, do not be afraid. Because if we only exist as a speck in time, honestly, a speck, compare this even just to the history that has happened, we are a speck. If that's all we are, then what's it all for? If death is the end, then live whichever way you want. You want to be like Chris Hemsworth? Go for it. If you want to own 100 properties, you want to own no properties, live in a tent, all your life doesn't matter. Because at the end, we're all in a coffin. We're all gone. doesn't matter what our legacy is. It's all over in the end. But in our hearts... We can all appreciate that our lives have meaning, that our lives extend beyond just what we see and hear now. Beyond just the physical, our lives extend into the eternal. And that's what makes Jesus' birth so special. The arrival of the Son of God, it is just a glimpse of the eternal story. Just before Jesus, well, not just before Jesus was born, 700 years before he was born. I I can't even appreciate what the scale of that is. That's multiple generations. That's where my my ancient relatives were still back in China fighting the, the Huns or something. Like, it's so far, far, far away. It's 700 years before Jesus. This was ages ago. God's prophet, Isaiah, had this to say. Welcome, Jeff. Welcome, Billy. Yeah, we're, we're, a, we're a family gathering today, so I was going to interrupt us. And, but it's here, 700 years ago, God's story has been revealed to us through the prophet Isaiah. Prophets, God's messengers, they're a reminder that God is writing his story. He didn't just suddenly decide, oh, you know what, I think it would be a good idea for me to send my son into the world. I think that would be special. No, God decided from the beginning of time, he gave these promises and we have a very clear indication of it here in Isaiah. Elizabeth read for us and uh, Phil read for us too. It was in the gospel of Matthew there. Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. God is with us. 700 years ago, what, 700 years before Jesus' birth, and then 2,000 years ago, Jesus fulfilled that. Virgin giving birth. One of the greatest miracles. Scientists don't even understand how babies come about. Like, yeah, they, we understand, you know, the mechanics, but, but there's this mystery to how does the biology of, of a little egg turn into a, an entire bit? There is a mystery there. And here we have a greater mystery here where the virgin conceives by the Holy Spirit. But you know that an even greater mystery than all of that, C.S. Lewis describes it as, as this. The central miracle asserted by Christians is the incarnation. They say that God became man. That's ridiculous. The greatest mystery, the greatest miracle 
of all history is that God would become man. Think about that. God must have some big plan up his sleeve. And see, this is all part of this idea that, that we are part of God's bigger, beautiful tapestry. And we are like this thread being weaved into that tapestry. This beautiful tapestry of God's glory. And we get to be part of that story. Now I want to just describe, like if you imagine history from the creation of the world to, to now. as being like an Olympic-sized swimming pool. And one end where you dive in, it's like a timeline. Imagine that as a timeline. You have um, creation. And then, um, you know, somewhere along the timeline, you have, uh, I don't know, pyramids or d- dinosaurs somewhere along the way and then pyramids. Uh, and then somewhere along the pool timeline, you have us here today. That, that's the timeline as the Olympic swimming pool. Jesus' arrival is like a five-ton elephant belly flopping right in the middle and causing ripples throughout that entire timeline. Don't take that analogy too far, but it's this idea that Jesus' arrival into the world, into time and space, changes everything. All that was before, all that was after. If Jesus didn't come in the flesh, then that timeline stays still. But Jesus' arrival changes everything. Changes everything for our story. Changes everything for the world. It means God's plan is unfolding that his plan for salvation, his plan for restoring and renewing all of creation is happening. The sin that came in and broke the world is being healed. Jesus coming into the world changes everything. The central miracle of all, you know, I said, C.S. Lewis said, um, you know, Christians, it's the incarnation. They say that God became man. And this means a few things for us as I, as I reflect on that. As, as we think of, you know, when we think of Jesus becoming man, becoming flesh, we see that the, the God of the universe cares about the physical. You know, we think, we can confuse saying that the flesh doesn't matter. The flesh has priority in God's creation. God didn't create spiritual beings and leave it at that. He created physical beings. And so just a couple of implications for us as the people of God. It means every person made is made in the image of God. Every person made is unique and has dignity. And so anything in the world that dehumanizes, anything like racism, discrimination, anything we say, oh, your, your job's below here or, or your gender's here or anything that starts to rank people, dehumanizes to be less than human is wrong because God cares about people. He cares about the whole person. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. God came into the world as a human to redeem humanity. Um, and I, I like seeing this picture. Um, it's a stone block, but inside that stone block is actually a trough for where animals feed. You've probably heard this. This is what we call a manger. So different from what we, you know, we romanticize the picture of Jesus' birth. We romanticize it like something out of Pinterest, you know, lovely wooden crate, and you put a baby in that. But God, Jesus, was born. And he was placed in one of these stone troughs, a feeding trough for cattle. Like imagine putting your newborn in a dog bowl. I mean, it's not the same, but you know, it's, it's ridiculous. But it's, it's, it's to emphasize just how ordinary, how humble God coming into the world was. The God of the universe is he, not impressed by outward appearances, he's not impressed with big parades, you know, if we imagine a king coming into the world, we we imagine big processional, the crowds gathered, you know, think of the king's coronation, that sort of stuff, everyone, TV cameras all lined up, we think of, I think of Aladdin, you know the scene where, where Aladdin comes in on an elephant and he's throwing out gold, this is befitting in our eyes of a king coming into the world, but the king of kings comes in a humble setting, almost like a flickering light in a dim room. He comes into such an ordinary birth. 
because God cares about the ordinary. God cares about what's happening in here. God is one of the ordinary, one who steps into reality with us, not high above us, but steps down as a baby into our world. A love that transcends earthly majesty. The word became flesh. A revelation of God's glory. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The light of the world has come into the world. The light of the world has stepped into darkness. The light of the world. When you bring light into darkness, it impacts everything. Darkness flees. When the light of the world comes into the world, everything is changed. I've got this picture from World Vision. I love what World Vision does as they go and, uh, and alleviate poverty. Um, this is in Romania. And, and World Vision said they went and built all these playgrounds in these areas. This was like one of the first things they did. And when you build a playground, an amazing thing happens. You start to hear the sound of laughter, of life, of safety. Communities start to gather around these playgrounds. And I can't help but imagine Jesus having that impact when he comes as the light of the world. He has this impact on everything around him. Everything changes because the light of the world has stepped into darkness. And God, the light of the world, is with us. And then God, he calls us the light of the world. His spirit dwells in us. We are forever changed. When we have met Jesus, we cannot be unchanged. When we have met Jesus... Nothing is the same. Our, our lives are restored in Christ. We start to live a brand new life by His Spirit. Everything that we thought about the world is flipped upside down. Kingdom values, right? We have the Spirit of God in us, and the fruits of the Spirit start to grow in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. These are the values of the kingdom. These are the things that demonstrate God is changing us, that the light has entered us. This is the church that heals one another. When his spirit is in us, when we are a community of his spirit, when we experience that love and safety, we are changed. The light of the world has come. And we are invited to follow the light of the world, to trust in him. As we heard, to take up our cross and follow him. This is the call of Jesus. The light of the world invites us to trust in him and he places his light in us. This is the greater story, the greater tapestry of God's glory. I just want to finish with this um, as we enter into our next song from Luke. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God. I mean, it was a humble setting, but out in the fields there was nothing humble about that. <laughs> a multitude of angels burst into the setting scene and sing glory to God. That is the greater tapestry. That's the greater story that we belong to. Our lives don't just start and end our lives are part of God's bigger story. And our response during Christmas is glory to God in the highest. That he has come into the world. That the God of all eternity has stepped into his creation. Like a master artist stepping into his beautiful artwork. God has entered our world and everything has changed. And so let us sing... You know, Hark the Herald Angel Sings Gloria. Uh, I don't know, that, you know, that, oh, that song, let's sing with our hearts and sing glory to God. Gloria in excelsis Deo means glory to God in the highest. So let us stand and sing. Glory. Angels we have heard on high Sweetly singing all the place Mountains in reply, echoing their joy strains. Oh, 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 oh,
thank you we can respond in joyful song that christ has come glory in excelsis deo to god be the glory father we thank you that we are part of your bigger story that our lives do not begin and end with our birth and death but we are part of your story to bring glory to your name that we have been saved because of Jesus. Help us to live that out in our lives in joyful response, to live out the truth of the gospel as we point others to the light of the world in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. We've come to a time of communion. Oh, I'm going to um, let us grab a seat. I'll, I'll have um, Mel come to help us with this as well. Um, look at us. May Mel to come up and, oh, with the kids and Jeff, you can help hand out the elements if that'd be all right. You're going to hand out these elements for us. Um, but as we come to communion, you know, it's a gift from God that we get to join in the story. This is another sign that we participate in God's bigger story. You know, communion isn't something we just listen to and, and, and do. This is a partaking of, of the gospel story. A reminder that Christ died for us, his body broken for us, his blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
Whenever we eat and drink of this, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. This story doesn't end. Jesus died and rose again, and he will come again. And on that day, all things will be made right. His kingdom will come in full. We will be raised with him in glory. We will see him face to face. The Christmas story will be complete. What a glorious day that will be. So uh, if we could hand out the elements, we'll drink and eat together. So hold on to those elements. I feel up to pray pray for us. Yeah, let's pray. Yeah, what an amazing gift it was that you sent, yeah, Jesus, us being separated from you because of our rebellion um um yeah through this this humility that you uh, that jesus gave up everything came down was born in a stable laid in a manger um the absolute humility of that giving up everything for us and then yeah fulfilling that um that loneliness by suffering the worst possible death, death on the cross. But all of that was to purchase our freedom, our forgiveness, and our reconciliation to you. And yeah, we're just overwhelmingly thankful for that, that we can stand now in that grace. I just want to remember that and continually praise you for that. Amen. I need to take mine. Yep, and now, yeah, let's take the, the bread as a symbol of Jesus' body broken and the wine, the juice, as the cup of the new covenant of his, in his blood. Let's eat and drink now. I love communion. It's a reminder of the gospel. Grace over grace over grace. It's just this free gift of God. And let us continue. Finish with our song, Because He Lives. Let us stand together and praise because God together. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone.
will and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives. Father, we thank you that your story continues and we get to be a part of that. And Lord, we pray that this Christmas we bring you glory in the way we serve one another, in the way we serve the lowly and the poor. We pray that you would be glorified in us and through us. And may the Lord be with us all. May his face shine upon us and give us peace. May the Lord turn his face upon us. May his presence be with us everywhere we go. In his name we pray. Amen. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. We're going to keep hanging out. We have morning tea over there with a Greek-speaking fellowship. Tomorrow morning, we're going to have a combined service. The Greek-speaking fellowship will join us in here. Um, and then we'll head off and do our Christmas stuff. So, yeah, see you then.